You're listening to the Hog Beat Hour with Andrew Hutchinson, Alex Trader, and Mason Choate on ESPN Arkansas and HitThatLine.com. Now, here's your host, Mason Choate. Welcome to the Hog Beat Hour. I'm your host, Mason Choate, along with Andrew Hutchinson, who is the managing editor of Hogbeat.com and Alex Trader, recruiting expert over at Hogbeat.com. Uh, if you like this video, Give it a thumbs up. Subscribe to the YouTube channel. This is where we post all our press conferences, all of our podcasts, all of our breakdowns, stuff like that. Uh, so let's get into it, guys. Arkansas, the winning streak came to an end against Alabama. Uh, some of you might be thinking, well, that's old news. Well, we put episodes out on Thursday. So since the last episode, we have not been able to talk about Alabama. So Arkansas lost to Alabama. Hutch, and you have a really cool stat about that as far as like close games for Arkansas in the end. Yeah. I don't know if uh, Arkansas fans think it's very cool because uh, it's not a good one. Uh, this was the 16th time under Eric Musselman uh, during these past three seasons that Arkansas uh, has had the ball with the shot clock off at the very end of regulation or overtime and a chance to either win the game or tie the game. Like a, one of those clutch situations, 16 times, uh, they have been successful in only three of those. Uh, and one of those was Mason Jones banked three to beat Georgia Tech in Muss's first year. So that was a little bit of luck. Uh, the other two were, were Jalen Tate getting fouled and making free throws in the closing seconds to beat Kentucky last year. And then, of course, uh, Devo's uh, game winner against uh, Oral Roberts uh, to send Arkansas to the lead eight. So, uh, not exactly a, a really big track record of success there, which personally to me is, is kind of surprising considering how uh, good of an X's and O's coach Eric Musselman is. And of course, the, the question that everyone's always you know, going to debate about is, oh, should Arkansas have called the timeout? You know, against Alabama, they had the ball with like 20 something seconds left and they just kind of let Note dribble around and then he chunked up a weird off balance fade away three pointer. That was just a, a horrible, horrible look. Uh, Eric Mussman even said as much that he would have rather him, you know, drive and, and try to draw contact, get a layup, uh, kick it out for an open three, uh, one of those. Uh, but it didn't happen that way. Uh, should, should he have called a timeout and try to drop a play? Maybe, but this is just Eric Mussman's style. Plus, if you look back at those scenarios, I haven't broken down the exact numbers, but there were several of those opportunity times where there were a couple where Arkansas called a timeout, you know, with 26 seconds left to, you know, drop a play and it didn't work, or maybe the other team called a timeout after making a shot to set up their defense. So Arkansas had an opportunity to set up a play. Uh, and, and honestly, those scenarios have not worked out in Arkansas's favor either. I mean, it's, it's pretty, you know, there's no real correlation there. So I, I don't know if there's a real cut and dry answer, like, yes, he should, or no, he shouldn't call a timeout. Um, but it is a, an interesting stat to kind of keep an eye on as we go down the stretch with all these really tough games coming up that, that could go down to the wire and Arkansas could find itself in a, a similar situation. Yeah, I think, uh, you know, that is an interesting stat, but I'd be curious to see what it's like for other teams because, I mean, how how successful is any team when, you know, the pressure is on? Uh, of course, one team has to win the game, but I, I'd like to think that it's not just Arkansas who is not successful most of the time in that situation, but I might be wrong. Maybe most teams just have clutch guys. But no, I, I think you're exactly right with that point. That's one reason I haven't I haven't written a story about it on – Hogbeat or asked Eric Musselman about it because there's really you got to have some sort of something to compare it to you know does that rank last in the SEC then it's something noteworthy but if it's the same as everyone else then it's like okay well it's just average so I just don't know that because it would be really hard to research it for all 14 teams much less the the entire division one yeah and you have no time for that hush so but it is it is interesting so I think that this game against Alabama for the most part uh, I don't I don't know if you guys thought this. I think most people thought it, but it felt like Arkansas was going to have no shot. And then in the second half, they they made a run and they got it close. And it really all came down to you had J.D. Note back on the court. Alex, I'll bring you in on this. Once again, J.D. Note, two early fouls, and he had to sit, what, 16 minutes in the first half? 
Yeah, I think that's a huge killer when you when you don't have your best scorer on the court, um, arguably your best player out there. It, it, it's going to make a difference. And like Hutch was saying, and even before he brought that stat in, you know, I was coming in thinking, hey, you played a pretty poor game overall as a team uh, in terms of going out there and what you've been able to do the last couple of weeks. And you were still in a position with 26 seconds left to go out there and win the game with the ball in your best player or in your best scorer's hand. And there just wasn't anything able to come out of it. I think you take that and, and you're able to build on it if you're a staff and if you're a team that's looking to, to contend deep into this tournament. Um, obviously, you're not happy with the result of, hey, we ended up having this time to go score and we weren't able to get that done, uh, not not able to score in the last couple of minutes of this game from the field. But you, you had yourself in a position to win that game. And any time you're in that situation, um, after maybe not playing your best game, I think you have to kind of take that with a grain of salt and be a little bit um, excited with the resilience on the road coming off one of the biggest wins in program history. Yeah, I, I agree with you. And I think that the at least on the bright side for Arkansas, you saw Jalen Williams kind of took over as a scorer in this game. He had 15 field goal attempts. He had 22 points. And then, of course, you have Amude, who is continuing to be a consistent scorer for Arkansas, the guy that you expected coming into the season. He scored 19 against Alabama. And the big thing for Amude was he had nine rebounds, too. That's, that's a lot for Amude. And that's kind of something that they told him, hey, we need you to keep doing this. But as far as Note goes, they said, Musselman said that the next day in practice, they had him defending with a towel over his head so he couldn't poke his hands in there. So you you like the fact that he can poke in there and get a steal. He's as good as anybody in the SEC is that, at that. But it, at some point, when does he stop, Hutch? Because you need the steals, but also you need your scorer on the court more than you need the steals. And what I think is most frustrating is that some of the fouls that JD picks up are really okay, dumb fouls, to be quite honest. Like it's not even him trying to reach in for a steal. I feel, I mean, he gets those obviously, but like I feel like the second foul against uh, Alabama, it was like just just dumb. Like I like what are you, what are you thinking there? And and also the other thing is is he's got a reputation at this point, you know, the officials know, okay, this guy is a guy that fouls a lot. So we're going to be extra, you know, careful watching him. I mean, that goes both ways. I mean, Jalen Williams, someone pointed this out on the message board, Jalen Williams has a reputation for drawing charges. And so if there's ever kind of an iffy, like, Oh, is it a blocker charge? Oh, well, it's Jalen Williams. So it's gotta be a charge. I feel like he's probably gotten the benefit of the doubt on a few of his charges. So it's similar with JD Note. He's, he's just got to be really, careful and you mentioned that drill that that Eric Mossman was uh, having him do I mean he you got to give it to Eric Mossman the dude's got a drill for everything I, I asked him uh, after uh, before the Missouri game I was like hey y'all really struggled to finish at the rim against Alabama that was something else I mean Audis Tony and uh, Kamani Johnson they just really really struggled and I think they were like nine of 25 on shots at the rim layups or dunks and Eric Moss was like, oh, yeah, sure, we got some drills for that. You know, we, we've got them down there finishing through, you know, uh, those blocking dummies. I, I, it's kind of what I have envisioned in my head, like the, the football team uses. Uh, they got, you know, GAs down there just smacking them uh, and trying to get them to finish through contact. That's something they did last year with Moses Moody, and it seemed to work wonders because Moses really struggled early in the year finishing at the basket. And then, you know, later in the year, he was one of the best players in the country at finishing at the basket. So uh, Eric Musselman, got to give him credit. The dude, I don't know if these are all things that he's picked up, like, from other people in the NBA or if he's just, like, you know, sitting at, in his bed at night going, hmm, what could I do as a drill or what? But the dude comes up with some really uh, interesting uh, ways to, to solve very specific issues with his team. So Arkansas lost to Alabama 68-67 to on Saturday. The winning streak was ended at nine games. Uh, honestly, some people were saying, I know the question was asked in the press conference, does this, does this take like a weight off your shoulders? You don't have to worry about it anymore. And, of course, you know, Eric Musselman's like, well, we would have rather won the game. But uh, they came back and they beat a Missouri team easily, 76-57. to I think most people expected that. Uh, you know, you had the fact that they were on the road, but I don't really think that Missouri has a hostile environment. I don't know if you guys saw the crowd, but 
it wasn't it wasn't anything to brag about. I think it was like one dollar tickets and free bobblehead night, and they still had like forty percent capacity or something like that. So I I don't know. I I'm, I feel like that might be rude towards Missouri, but you know. Um, so Arkansas wins, and it was it was the Trey Wade and Stanley Amude game in this one. Um, I mean Amude twenty three points. This dude, he's really lighting it up from three, especially on the road, Hutch. Yeah, he has really gotten comfortable. And, you know, Eric Musselman was talking uh, on his, his press conference uh, the day after the game and, and saying that, you know, Stanley's really bought in, you know, lately, you know, to, to the amount of work it takes to be successful at this level. I mean, he, he lit it up at, at South Dakota because – well, I mean, it's South Dakota, and, and he was just so much better than everybody else. That's why he was scoring 20-plus every night. At, in the SEC, it's not quite as easy, and, and I think he's, he's picked that up, and he's like, okay, I need to be spending all of my free time in the gym getting shots up. And I think that's why you've seen his, his shot fall at a much higher cliff. I mean, during non-conference play, he was not shooting well at all from beyond the arc. And over the last, I don't know, three, four, five games, maybe he's shooting probably close to 50% from deep. And it's just been a dramatic turnaround. And it, it sounds like it's something that might be sustainable. Like, I'm, obviously, he's not going to shoot 50% or go six of nine from deep every game. But I think over the course of the last, you know, five games of the season, entering the SEC tournament, NCAA tournament, if he can just make it shoot 40% from three, that would be a massive, massive benefit for Arkansas because that's something they didn't have and they haven't had pretty much all years is somebody that can be a threat from, from the outside. And that would be just a, a massive, massive you know, development for Arkansas. So it seems like um, the sixth man has just been nailed down. It's Devontae Davis. He's the guy who's going to get the most minutes off the bench. And against Missouri – I mean, he shot the ball really well, Alex. He was three of five from the field, two of three from three-point range. I mean, this if you can have Devo Davis come off the bench and serve the role that really he served late last season, that would be really valuable for this team, Alex. Yeah, certainly. And, and you know, like we said, you come into this game expecting to win and expecting to win big after what happened last time uh, in Bud Walton. But – Missouri never led in this game, and that is is large. Uh, that is in large part due to what the bench was able to do, and that that's you know that's Devo Davis coming in and hey, we can get JD knows hey a rest. We can get these guys a rest, and, and trust that the bench is going to be able to keep uh, keep this lead and keep the Hogs momentum going. And that doesn't happen without a strong six man. So I think it's huge for the Hogs to kind of find that depth and find hey. These are the guys that we can trust to bring in the game when our starters aren't in there, and, and they're going to keep that that going for us. I, I think it's massive. A few more things to hit from the Missouri game. So Arkansas is really good at shutting down the opposing team's best player. They did so against Kobe Brown against Missouri. He was 3 of 10 from the field, 6 points, 5 rebounds. So Hutch, I mean, Eric Musselman talks about it. We know that they, they're they always going to key, on in, on, key in on the opposing team's best player, but – to be able to shut him down, this team is playing defense at such a high level, and that I think that is what has helped them on this winning streak more than anything, rather than you know scoring or whatever. It's been the defense because I mean, how many games in a row did they hold teams to under forty percent shooting? I don't know. Was it was there a game that that didn't happen? Was the Alabama game what cut that streak or something? I think Georgia ended up shooting a little over 40%, you know, because they got off to such a hot start in the first half. And then the second half, they held them well below 40% when they really pulled away. Uh, but, yeah, the defense has been just a really uh, – I, I think I saw a stat the other day, uh, and maybe someone posted on the message board, that, like, since January 1st, Arkansas has the second-best defense in the country in terms of efficiency or whatever. I think that's a Bart Torvik uh, – I don't think that's how you say it uh, – stat – uh, so yeah, they, they've been really, really good. Uh, so I, I think that this defense that that's key because that can travel, you know, sometimes you're not going to shoot well on the road or in the NCAA tournament, SEC tournament, but what can always travel is your defense. And that's why I think that that, that could be a big thing for, for Arkansas in terms of, you know, postseason success is this is the way they're playing defense. And honestly, it's probably why they played, 
you know, made a, a deep run in last year's tournament. I think Ken Palm ended uh, at the end of the season had Arkansas with the 10th best defensive uh, adjusted defensive efficiency. So that I think Arkansas is creeping up in that stat. And uh, if they keep playing the defense like they have been, uh, it, it's definitely a team to watch out because it, 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 that's kind of the recipe for success in the postseason. All right, well, coming up next, we're going to talk about some more basketball. We're going to talk about some maybe X factors moving forward. We're going to preview the big ranked matchup with Tennessee coming to town on Saturday. And then later on, we're going to talk some football, got some uh, some new numbers on the new coaching hires. And then we'll talk baseball, look ahead to opening weekend to end off the hog beat hour. You're listening to the hog beat hour with Andrew Hutchinson, Alex Trader, and Mason Choate on ESPN Arkansas on hitthatline.com. Now, here's your host, Mason Choate. All right, we're back here on the Hog Beat Hour. Mason Choate, along with Andrew Hutchinson and Alex Trader, the Hog Beat crew. Uh, if you want to check out any of our work, anything we do, which is the best coverage of Arkansas athletics around, uh, go to hogbeat.com, H A W G B E A T.com, and then check out our YouTube. Any type of video you want, any type of press conference, any, I mean, like podcasts, we got the Diamond Hog podcast over there. We got the hog beat hour. We've got Alex breaking down film. We've got anything you need at hogbeat.com. Plus, we have the best sports writer in the state of Arkansas, Andrew Hutchinson. So uh, go check it out and go subscribe. Hutch, are we still running the student deal? Yeah, yeah, we are. Uh, you, if you are a student anywhere in the country, whether it be the University of Arkansas or somewhere else, uh, as long as you have a .edu email address with that school, uh, you can send me an email from that account at andrewhutchinson413 at gmail.com, and I will hook you up for your first year of Hogbeat for just eleven ninety five. That's usually about $100, so you're getting it for basically 12 That's a pretty good deal. Yeah. You, you know what else I forgot about? I, I forgot about J.C. Hoops. Like, why don't we have J.C. Hoops on for these basketball segments too? Because I feel like he knows more basketball than uh, myself. Hutch, I don't know about you. Yeah, he's, he's definitely way more knowledgeable with basketball than any of us, probably any of us combined. Uh, of course, he's also in law school, so uh, he's probably studying law right now as we record this. Who knows? <laughs> yeah, I mean, Hutch, we're journalism guys, so we, we just – we took the easy route. Except for you, I think you, like, minored in math or something because you're a nerd, but – Yeah, I'm a nerd. Okay. Okay. Uh, all right, so we're going to talk some more basketball. So, of course, the Tennessee game is this weekend, big matchup in Bud Walton Arena. But before we get to that, I want to talk about just this roster of Arkansas because um, you have your your Jalen Williams and your J.D. Note. And we've talked about this before. Stanley Mude, he's starting, to, he's starting to come on as, you know, a more consistent scorer, the guy that you needed. But I'm curious, like, you had Trey Wade. He scored 12 against Missouri, but it seems to just be like Trey Wade has Missouri's number. So – uh, but if you could have Trey Wade start scoring consistently, if you could have Audis Tony figure it out, I mean, he only played six minutes against Missouri, didn't put up a shot, and he had four fouls. So, um, I I, I want to ask you guys, and we'll start with we'll start with Alex because, yeah, we'll start with Alex. Alex, moving forward, aside from Jalen Williams, aside from JD Note, and maybe even lead out Stanley Amude. Who is, who is key for this Arkansas team that you need him night in and night out to be successful moving forward if this team wants to make a run, and not even not just in the SEC tournament, but in the NCAA tournament? Yeah, I think it, it can come down to a couple of guys, and it depends on what you want from success because you do have J.D. Note and Stanley Amude and Jalen Williams getting their points on the offensive side of the ball. So I, I think it really comes down to who's going to be out there and be able to knock down shots if they get them, but not not necessarily run the offense through them, as well as getting that consistent defensive um, or having that presence on the defensive um, side of the ball. And I think that's got to be Trey Wade. He, he, like we mentioned, has Missouri's number, didn't necessarily have a great game against Alabama, but against Missouri was plus 27 in his time on the court. That's just – it. it is – Big when you have a guy out there who's just putting in the, the extra effort on all those plays and able to make the hustle plays, make the defensive stops, and then also be able to count on them for a bucket or two when, when the time comes. I, I, and I, I think Trey is that guy um, and needs to be that guy if Arkansas wants to have any chance of returning to the Elite Eight. 
Yeah, I, I, I think Trey Wade is a guy that he's got to be more consistent. But for me, it's Audis Tony because if I look at the games where Arkansas has just looked dominant, it's it's when Audis Tony just quietly puts up 14 or 16 points because it's just those little those little passes down down under and he just throws it up and it's an easy bucket. There's two points and those just quickly add up. But it's it's that and then Tony. I mean, I, we've seen him a lot this year. He's guarded the, the opposing team's best player. I mean. He's, he's an elite defender at times, but he also adds on the offensive side. And when he's not doing either one of those because he's not on the court against Missouri, he's only on the court for six minutes. Um, of course, he didn't need it against Missouri. But you, if you can have Audis Tony playing at his best, giving you 12, anywhere from 10 to 16 points a night, I think that, that that's key for this Arkansas team because he's part of that starting five and he's going to play. Um, and you need him to do that because he's so valuable – um, in those little scrappy situations like I'm talking about, like Eric Musselman has talked about. I mean, every time Musselman talks about it, he's like, it's so key for our team for Audis Tony to do that. And same with Trey Wade, like you mentioned, Alex. I mean, he's always talking about Trey Wade. What Trey Wade provides is is so valuable to this team, but it's he has to do that. If he's one of the, if it's one of those nights where he's not doing it and Musselman's just gonna sit him all night, then that's that's not good for Arkansas. So um, you just need a little bit more consistency from those guys. But, Hutch, do you have anybody else or anything to add to that? Yeah, the one guy I was going to bring up was was Tony, like you did. And the thing I would add is that he is such a really good defender. I'm glad you touched on that because I think that sometimes goes unnoticed by the casual observer. And, and you know, Eric Mussman mentioned it after – you know, uh, mentioned it on Wednesday's press conference that even though – he struggled to finish against Alabama. He still played really good defense. And, you know, if he could just be consistent in his finishing, you know, I mean, think about it. He went one, I think he went one of 11 against uh, Alabama, or maybe it was 0 for 11. I can't, I think, I, I can't remember. But let's just say he's one for 11 and he goes five for 11 instead. So he's still under 50%, but that's four more shots. That gives you eight more points. And it's a one point game you lost. So, I mean, it, there's so many different things that could have gone differently in that game. But to me, Audis Tony not finishing at the rate that he usually does uh, was probably the most, the biggest, most glaring thing for me. Uh, so, I, I would say him. And I mean, you could really make a case for Devontae Davis because he's been there, done that. We've seen what he did last year. You can make a case for Chris Likes. You know, he had that really good stretch of a few games where it was just like, oh my gosh, this guy you know, maybe he's going to be really good for them. Uh, so, I mean, that's that's the beauty of this roster is there's so many pieces. You know, if you just get a couple of them, you know, let's say there's six of them, I just say two of them have really good games and live up to, like, their full potential each game, and the other guys just aren't terrible, that's a pretty good recipe for Arkansas, you know, because you know what you're going to get out of J.D. Note. You know what you're going to get from, from Jalen Williams. And you feel like maybe Amude can be that guy, that third guy, where you know you're going to get something from him. And if you just get throw in another couple of guys in there, uh, that they're going to be they're going to be tough to beat. Well, yeah, that's the thing. If you can get that consistent scoring from a Mude, where he, you're getting you're getting what you expect from him, and you add that on top of Williams and Note, that really helps. If you look back at the Alabama game, you got that from a Mude, but you couldn't get it from Note until the second half because he was out for the whole first half. I mean, I'm curious, Hutch. I, I get that you want to sit him because he's got two fouls four minutes into the game. But that game, we heard earlier in the season from Eric Musselman, if the if the opposing team gets a 10-point lead or so, then he'll probably throw Note back in with two more fouls or with two fouls in the first half. That game, I know it got up to 10 in the first half, Alabama's lead did, and I can't remember if it got to more. And Note was still on the bench. Of course, he came in with like two seconds left in the first half. But – I'm curious, why do you think that is? I mean, do you think that Eric Musselman was comfortable? He felt like his team was going to come back? Because I think – I mean, they did. It was, what, 37, 32 at halftime? Yeah, I, I think it did get up to double digits briefly because I think Arkansas quickly answered and was able to get it back in. And so that's why we, why we maybe didn't see J.D. Note. But it is – I mean, it's just, it's just Eric Musselman's strategy. I mean – who am I to question Eric Musselman? The dude's forgotten more about basketball than I'll ever know. But it is something where you're like, man, you know, if they could have just put him in there for, you know, an extra four or five minutes, you know, then 
that, I mean, sure, if he picks, if you put him in and he immediately picks up a third foul, then yes, sit him and don't, don't put him back in. But I would have liked to see him play a little bit more than just the four minutes he got. Um, and that could have been, again, in a one point game, that could have been the difference, you know, at the, at the end of the game and, and it being a loss versus a win. Yeah, but I mean, nothing you can do about it now. We can only talk about it. But let's talk about this Tennessee game this weekend. We know so far there's going to be, I think, I've seen six pro hogs coming back to town. Let's see, Dan Gafford, Moses Moody, Justin Smith, Jalen Tate, Bobby Portis. Who am I forgetting? Who's the last one? Uh, Did you say Mason Jones? Mason Jones. That's the last one, Mason Jones. So six of those. And then Red Out, that's that's another theme of the game. I mean, this the atmosphere is going to be pretty pretty rocking at three o'clock on Saturday. Game's going to be on ESPN. I mean, Tennessee coming off a win over number four Kentucky. This is not going to be easy. Arkansas did beat number one Auburn, but I I haven't watched a whole lot of Tennessee basketball. I don't know if you guys have, but do you think? How do you think Tennessee compares to Auburn? It's a it's an interesting matchup. You know, Eric Musman was talking about how Tennessee really kind of has four guys capable of being point guards and they they like to play three of them at the same time you know for stretches so they they can really you know handle the ball plus they're really good defensively I think they're top five nationally in uh, adjusted defensive efficiency uh, and they 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 go up they go for steals you know Eric Musman said that they they like to the jump passing lanes they like to uh, wrap around so like say say JD Note beats you off the dribble they'll wrap around and try to poke it out um and they so i mean they, they are a team that really goes after steals uh they play really good defense and then they they can also score the ball as well i mean they got one of the top three-point shooters in the conference and maybe even the country in in viscovi uh, so that they they've got a really good team uh, and that's that that was on display earlier this week when they just smoked kentucky so uh big big time matchup for our, for arkansas a uh, top 25 matchup in Bud Walton Arena for the second straight year after they went 23 years without having a matchup like that. So uh, I, I expect it to be an awesome atmosphere, and I'm, I'm really looking forward to it. Yeah, you mentioned Vescovi. He he leads them in scoring, and he's shooting – I mean, he's shooting 40% from three. That, it's 39.8, but it's 40% from three. And this – I mean, Arkansas has got to play defense against him, and I mean, we mentioned it earlier with Kobe Brown against Missouri. They're probably going to key on on Vescovi and try to limit him as much as they can. But, Alex, I'll ask you this real quick, just real quick answer. This, Do you think this is another Bud Walton Arena atmosphere that's going to give Arkansas at least five to ten points in this game, um, kind of like they did against Auburn? Absolutely. I don't think the atmosphere is going to be the problem in this game. Um, what we've seen from this team so far is that the- – this season, any game is winnable, but any game is also losable. So you definitely um, love to have it in front of the home crowd with the red out with everybody in town uh, and have have Bud Walton rocking. Yeah, I, you got to think you got to at least get this one if you're Arkansas, because you got to go to Tennessee to end out the regular season. So at least try to get the, the game on your home court, because that's going to be easier than when they go to Tennessee. Um, and of course, we know the schedule doesn't get easier. You got Kentucky, you got Florida. So this is, I mean, Arkansas has got to keep winning. So um, that's going to wrap it up for basketball, though. Up next, we're going to talk football, talk some new coaching hires, um, some numbers that goes along with that. And then we're going to talk baseball, get you set for opening weekend later here on the Hogbeat Hour. You're listening to the Hogbeat Hour with Andrew Hutchinson, Alex Trader, and Mason Choate on ESPN Arkansas on HitThatLine.com. Now, here's your host, Mason Choate. All right, we're back here on the Hogbeat Hour talking football this segment. Uh, of course, we know it's a slow period for football, but Arkansas did get a commitment from four-star defensive end Quincy Rose. Alex Trader, you did a film breakdown on him. Uh, tell us what you think of him after watching a little bit of his film. No, I think he's really explosive um, was, was the big takeaway that they've lined him up in, in kind of the defensive backfield with the linebackers a little bit. And then they also have him coming off the edge. They've had him as a down lineman. So he, he's really just kind of versatile, able to give you a couple different looks um, if you're on the defensive side of the ball. And then he also gets after the quarterback really, really quickly um, and, and hits hard. So it, it's all stuff you like to see from a talented edge rusher and pairing him with Caleb James is a big get for this defensive staff. So Hutch, I I was reading your story and 
you know, this is a four-star guy, but he only has offers from Memphis, Arkansas State, Jackson State. What are people just kind of, you know, looking over him or what, what's going on with that? Yeah, I mean, it's interesting because he's he's kind of a guy that came out of nowhere almost. Like he he was a uh, a prospect. I mean, he, he went to Jacksonville. Uh, he's tra- since transferred to North Little Rock, um, but he is – uh, a really talented he looks the part he's got the measurables uh and i think he's really just starting to kind of uh blow up i mean he uh he, he's gotten some interest i think i heard that he's like got some interest from like lsu and oregon and some other big time you know fbs power five programs uh they just hadn't pulled the trigger yet and i think arkansas really kind of wanted to get him wrapped up and secured uh, before anyone else could swoop in with an offer and try to wow them like, Oh, Hey, you should get leave state, leave the state and come to, you know, say for example, like Oregon, like come all the way out to the West coast and look at all this Nike stuff. Like it's always good to get those hometown guys locked in uh, and secured, especially when a guy, I mean, just, just look at him, just look at pictures of him. He looks the part and, and I'm anxious to see how he performs in a, uh, in a, uh, North Little Rock team that's maybe a little bit better and more depth and everything than than the school he was at before. Okay, so I'm looking at rivals.com right now, and it looks like he dropped down to a three star. Um, so we've been saying four star, but now he's a three star. Hutch, you're throwing your arms up in the air. What's up with that? I literally have no idea what happened here because he was unrated. And I reached out to the rivals people and said, Hey, this guy is getting ready to commit to Arkansas. Can you give him a rating? And they did, they gave him a 5.8 four-star rating. And now here I've got it pulled up and, and he's a 5.7. So I'm, I'm going to have to do some asking around about that. That uh, is very surprising. Okay. Well, I'm, I'm glad, (laughs) I'm glad that we got that before, before we posted this. So uh, but so now that he brings the 2023 class for Arkansas up to nine total commitments, and now they're ranked, I mean, according to rivals, they're ranked fourth in the nation, Alex. So, I mean, that's, that's pretty good. We know it's early, but Arkansas is setting themselves up really well in the 2023 class so far. Yeah, I believe uh, the three ahead of them are Georgia and Notre Dame, who you can kind of expect. And, and then Texas tech with 13 commits. So, with the nine commits, uh, having that average high enough to be third in the country, I, I think that's really impressive, and it's really a, a great showing so far from Sam Pittman on the trail. Um, clearly, you're not done. You don't have the quarterback that you're looking for, um, where there maybe was some movement in, in this week's Rivals 250 update. Um, but but you've got a bunch of guys who you're looking at, who you're, who you're you know, maybe it looks like getting close to being able to bring on. Um, it, it's really just a matter of closing those deals. And so far, Sam Pittman has been able to do that for the most part with this 23 group. Okay. So uh, other news on the football front, we saw that uh, the the salaries for the new coaches, Adams and Bowman. So they both had one year deals with Arkansas. Let's see. Deke Adams is going to be making 400,000 and Dominic Bowman is going to be making 350000 So, Hutch, you kind of looked into that. How does that rank compared to the previous coaches at those same positions that were there last year? Yeah, so Bowman, he's making the exact same amount as Sam Carter was making. I was a little bit surprised by that. I figured that, you know, hiring a, a relatively young, unknown coach that only had one year of experience at the FBS level would maybe – be making less than Sam Carter, who you know started out much lower than 350, but got the raise because of his performance. Uh, and then also Deke Adams kind of surprised me that he's making 400 because Jamil Ashley was making 300, and and Deke Adams was part of a staff that got fired at Florida International. So I was a little bit surprised, uh, but I'm wondering, you know, maybe maybe this is just a sign that Arkansas is really making a commitment to pay its assistant coaches and we're getting ready. I mean, we haven't seen any of the raises yet. Like, we don't know what Kendall Browse is going to be making now, but we feel like he's, he's getting a raise after Miami went after him. Uh, so, yeah, I don't know what, what that's going to look like. I, I'm very anxious to see what kind of raises are handed out to see how they stack up with the other assistant coaches on staff because I think Jimmy Smith has earned himself a raise. 
you know, and I think Cody Kennedy has done really well. So I, I'm anxious to see, and, and Michael Shearer definitely has earned himself a raise. I think he's one of the lowest paid assistant coaches in the SEC. Uh, so I, I'm, I'm really fascinated to see what this final salary pool is for the assistant coaches. So according to Andrew Hutchinson of hogbeat.com, uh, let's see, they're making the 10 on field assistants are making a combined 5.325 million, uh, for the 2022 season. And you said that it's believed they've never had a salary pool of more than 5 million for assistance. So, of course, if you're saving a couple bucks on your head coach, Sam Pittman, who I, I mean, is he getting a raise as well? And then you know, that, that allows you to pay assistance more, right? Yeah, I think Sam Pittman's definitely getting a raise, more than just the $750,000 raise that he earned by winning eight games this year. Uh, but there, it, it, to me, the, the salaries that were announced with these two new hires tells me that they are getting ready to spend a lot of money on the football team. And to me, if you're an Arkansas fan, you like to hear that because that means you're not going to let money be a factor in, in guys leaving. Like if, if, if Barry Odom is going to leave, it's going to be because he wants to be a head coach again. Or if Kendall Browse wants to leave, you know, it's probably because he's going to be hired as a head coach somewhere. Like it's not going to be because they're getting a higher paycheck to be a coordinator somewhere else. And I, I think it's, to me, that that is a good sign if you're an Arkansas fan. Okay. Um, so let's see recruiting, anything else recruiting wise that, that we're missing out on. I know that some, some players are going to be coming on campus here in the next few weeks. Anybody to keep an eye on, Alex, that you've been looking at? Um, I mean, in terms of players that are visiting in the next couple of weeks, you have former Oklahoma commit, um, really high-end running back, Trayon Webb, coming on March 5th, um, as well as a couple of other guys in that mix. Uh, as far as recruiting from front goes, we, we did just drop our um, defensive end uh, big board for, for 2023. Um, and, and it did include Quincy Rhodes before he committed, and then I had to edit that a little bit once he did actually um, pull the trigger on that commitment um, from a top target to a, a guy who's locked in with the Hogs. Um, but a couple couple really big names there, the number 27 player in the country, is a major target for Arkansas um, in that group. And then, you know, just uh, movement across the rivals 250 that was updated. Um, I believe Hutch wrote a story that had some of Arkansas's top targets um, moved in across there and kind of where, where they're looking at. Um, so, so definitely go check that out on Hogbeat. Yeah, if you want to, if you want to see anything else recruiting wise from Alex or Hutch, just go to Hogbeat.com. Um, most of most of that stuff is going to be premium, so definitely subscribe. It's well, it's it's so worth your money. Like you are going to get your money's worth when it comes to any of the uh, subscription-based stuff at Hogbeat.com. That includes the trough. That includes um, premium stories from Alex, from myself, from Hudge. Um, and if you're a student, it, it's a hundred percent worth your money because you're paying significantly less, and uh, you can keep up with your favorite team. So uh, that's gonna end it for football. Coming up next, Hutch and I we're gonna talk some baseball. Uh, we're going to talk the the starting the starters for pitching. We're going to look ahead to Illinois State this weekend. Hutch, you did a whole season preview that, to be honest, I was a little glad I didn't have to write because that was a lot. But you did it for us because you're the man. So we'll talk about that a little bit here on the Hogbeat Hour. You're listening to the Hogbeat Hour with Andrew Hutchinson, Alex Trader, and Mason Choate on ESPN Arkansas on HitThatLine.com. Now, here's your host, Mason Choate. All right, welcome back to the Hogbeat Beat Hour. This segment, we're going to be talking Arkansas baseball. Uh, if things look a little bit different, it's because Hutch and I just got back from the, the press conference. Hutch is at a Zaxby's. I'm on campus at the U of A. So uh, either way, um, we found out starting rotation, and we found out starting lineup. So let's start with starting rotation for pitching. Of course, as you expected, Connor Nolan Friday night, Hagan Smith Saturday night, and Jackson Wiggins on Sunday. Well, not Saturday night, on Saturday and Jackson Wiggins on Sunday. Um, so we know, we know Nolan and we know Wiggins, like those are the two or not Wiggins, Nolan and Smith. Those are the two that you expected, but then Wiggins, Dave Van Horn said, well, it was between Wiggins and there's a couple other guys who could have done it, but we know that Wiggins has the experience. So that's who we're going with. So Hutch, just your general thoughts to begin with. 
Yeah, I mean, I, I think a couple of weeks ago I talked to uh, Caden Wallace, and, and he told me he thought Hagen Smith was at least their second best starting pitcher, if not their best. Uh, so uh, to have him starting on Saturday doesn't necessarily surprise me. Plus, uh, Dave Van Horn has kind of indicated that in previous comments. Uh, Jackson Wiggins, it wasn't a big time surprise for like the casual observer, but those who have really followed kind of these preseason scrimmages and things like that. I wasn't, I wasn't convinced. And I'm not sold that Wiggins will stay in that starting rotation. Uh, it, it might be one of those things where he starts out in the rotation. And if it goes well, he'll stay there. And if not, then maybe somebody else. You know, Mark, uh, Dave Van Horn mentioned uh, Mark Adamiak. He's a guy that maybe could have gotten the nod for a, a starting spot. Uh, but in the last scrimmage, he took a line drive off the shin. Uh, he says like a 100-mile-per-hour line drive off the, the bat of Peyton Stovall. And that kind of – ended his hopes for, for being a, a guy that, that starts in the weekend rotation, but it sounds like he's okay. Like he's, he's not seriously hurt, uh, but they're, they're going to bring him out of the bullpen this first weekend uh, and go with Wiggins instead. He, ha- he does have some experience. So it, overall, I think, you know, Connor Nolan, I think is a very, very good pitcher. And I think he can fill that, that ACE role, even if he's not a big time major league baseball prospect. And then you got Smith and Wiggins who both are, are potential you know, first round talents as far as a, a scouting perspective. It's just a matter of, you know, can Smith handle the stage of being in college? You know, he's a true freshman and, and can Wiggins get more consistent, throw strikes and, uh, you know, get people out and, and actually, you know, get deep into the game. We haven't seen him do that yet at the, at the college level. So as far as the bullpen goes, a couple of the names that Van Horn mentioned, uh, Cole Ramage was the one that, you know, caught your eye because he said he's the best he's ever been here at Arkansas. Um, and so he, I believe he said Ramage is up to what, 94, 95, or was it 93, 94 in that general range. And then he also mentioned Nick Griffin as a guy who might end up being a starter for Arkansas, um, but he's going to throw some innings this weekend as well. So uh, of the bullpen guys, you kind of mentioned Mark Adamiak there um, of the bullpen guys, who are you really looking forward to this weekend? And, a guy that you think is going to come out and make an impact, Hutch. Yeah, Ramage, I think his velocity isn't quite that. I, I can't remember what he said, but I, th- I think it's definitely – it's not as high as like a, uh, you know, a Jackson Wiggins or uh, someone like that. However, I think his name probably surprises anyone listening to this podcast because he has not pitched well the last several years, and he's a super senior, uh, but he's, he's coming back and – I saw him pitch in a, in a scrimmage this past weekend, and I was floored. I mean, he was facing the starting lineup, and he struck out five of the six guys he faced. The one guy he didn't strike out was Peyton Stovall, and he just put weak contact on the ball and, and got an infield single. Uh, so I, I was very impressed. And it seems like he's got a lot of confidence right now. He's a guy who could – I mean, the way Van Horn described it, he didn't say Kevin Copps's name, but the way he described it, he said, you know, he could pitch – a couple of times on the weekend, he could pitch, you know, maybe four innings at a time and close a game. He could uh, pitch very di- – he could start games. So, it sounds like he's a guy that's versatile enough to handle, you know, kind of maybe a lesser of a Kevin Copps role. Uh, again, I, I don't think we're ever going to see a Kevin Copps at the college baseball level again. Uh, but he's a guy that could be your versatile weapon that surprises people, comes out of nowhere, uh, out of the bullpen. Yeah, it seems like throughout this whole offseason period, it's kind of been different names of who is going to be that guy that the Kevin Cops, as you said, but it's, you know, it's not going to be Kevin Cops, but the guy who's going to serve the role is your your number one guy out of the bullpen. And it it, it, it seems like it's been different names at times. Now we're hearing Cole Ramage, uh, but it, it's really going to come down to these first few weekends, what you see out of the guys. So uh, that is yet to be seen. We've heard names, but as I said, you got to wait and see. But we also figured out what the starting lineup is going to be for Arkansas. So, uh, as expected, it's a it's basically what we did for our preview series. It's the, we got everything right, but Gregory's going to be in center. So I'll just go through it: Michael Turner at catcher, Peyton Stovall at first, Robert Moore at second, Caden Wallace at third, Jalen Battle short, uh, Jace Borfin left, Zach Gregory center, Brady Slavin's right and Chris Lanzilli, DH. So uh, we know that the outfield is loaded, and we know that really there's a, a group of uh, five guys, and then you have you just pick and choose who you want to DH, and Lanzilli's going to start as DH. 
Van Horn said, we're going to see Webb this weekend. He said that we're going to see Leach this weekend. So uh, you got to think that the Gregory and center has to do with Webb's injury, but also we know that Gregory's a guy who's going to get on base. Yeah, I think Gregory is one of those guys that, that as Dave Van Horn likes to say, is this guy made me play him. Just the way he's, he's played in scrimmages and practice, the guy, he, he gets on base, he puts the ball in play. Uh, if you look at last year's stats, I mean, uh, he's got, he had as many free passes as strikeouts. Uh, that's also partially because he just draws a lot of walks and gets hit by pitches. Uh, so, yeah, that, that is a little surprising. You know, I don't know if he's – I'm anxious to see how he handles center field defensively. I mean, we've been so spoiled with, you know, Christian Franklin and Dominic Fletcher and before that, Andrew Benatendi and Brett Eibner. I mean, there, there have been some incredible center fielders at Arkansas. And I don't know if, if Gregory is quite like that. I think he came to Arkansas as an infielder, and here he is playing center. Uh, but, you know, he, he's just a versatile guy, and, and his, his bat is going to get him in the lineup. Uh, and again, we, we're going to see different combinations. He said that, you know, Braden Webb was right there as far as, you know, getting in the lineup, whether it be at, in center or even uh, as your DH over Lanzilli. So I, I fully expect us to see some different combinations throughout the weekend against Illinois State. I know when we, we tweeted out the news of the lineup, a lot of people were curious, like, what happened to Webb? Um, you know, what? Where, where's Webb at? It's got to be because he's hurt. Why is Gregory starting in center? So uh, I, I just want to preface that Dave Inward said he talked to Webb. Webb told him he's about 85%. So uh, that's that's all we know. And as Hutch said, Gregory basically made him uh, play him. So that – and we know Webb's going to play, just as we know that Dylan Leach is going to play behind Michael Turner. Um, Hutch, I'm just curious from your perspective uh, – what are you expecting to see from the catchers? Do you see like playing two different types of games, uh, two different guys at the plate, or do you think it's just whoever's, whoever's hot that day? You know, it's really interesting because the last, I would say five years, we've had two guys start at catcher for a majority of the, uh, the games. I mean, I think Casey Opitz over the last three years started 80% of all the games at catcher. And before that, Grant Cook started 90% of the games at catcher. And that, that's really high. And I think Dave Van Horn likes to have a guy, especially if it's two guys of that caliber. Uh, but I don't know if he's got one guy this year that's going to handle 80% of the starts. Uh, I think we're going to see more of a split. I don't know if it'll be 50-50. You know, we all, it also hinges on, on Michael Turner being a healthy, uh, which he's battled injuries throughout his career. Uh, and also Dylan Leach, it sounds like he's really come along and developed. I mean, Dave Van Horn was very complimentary of him in his press conference, saying that he has really progressed, uh, and, and, you know, the guy's just – he works, and he doesn't, he doesn't get scared by competition either. I was really impressed. Uh, when I first found out that he was skipping his senior year to come to Arkansas, he was doing that with the intent of replacing Casey Opitz because he was supposed to be gone a year earlier – and then Casey Opitz is like, oh, no, I'm coming back. And he said, no, I'm, I'm, still, I'm still coming to, to Arkansas, even though I know I'm not going to be the starter. Uh, and even before Casey Opitz was coming back, they landed two graduate transfer catchers. And he said, no, I'm, I'm not scared. I'm still going to come. I'm going to fight for my spot. Uh, so I, I, I really like Dylan Leach's mindset, and I think that's going to get him on the field maybe more than, than backup catchers, you know, per se, uh, have in, in recent years. Well, the opponent this weekend for Arkansas is Illinois State. Uh, it's a team that came in a couple years ago and actually got a win against Arkansas. And uh, they've played they've played some big time opponents. They played Mississippi State. They played I think Mississippi State. They played Vanderbilt. Um, they've played some big time opponents, so they're not afraid to come into uh, Baumwalker Stadium and get a win or just fight Arkansas. So you were on the Zoom with their head coach. I'm curious, what did you learn about them? We know their week in rotation. Uh, I know there was a question asked about what what did he think was the identity of their lineup. Just give us a little insight on Illinois State. Yeah, Illinois State is uh, going to be a team that has a lot of veteran players uh, with a mix of younger guys, but they've got like a, a sixth year senior in their in their starting lineup. A couple other guys that have been around for a while that have played in big environments. Uh, Illinois State's a team that. I guess it's been three years now, 2019, they, they made the NCAA tournament and then almost knocked off a national seed in Louisville in, and to make it to the Super Regionals. They, they won their first two games, started the Regional 2-0 and before losing 
uh, their next two games to Louisville, but it was like a really close final game. They lost by like a run. So this is a quality baseball program, even though last year's record maybe doesn't indicate that. I think they finished with a losing record, uh, but their coach you know, mentioned they had several just, just major injuries right before the season started. Uh, COVID, I think he said, hit them hard early on, and they kind of got off to a slow start, and then it was just an uphill battle from there. So it, it is a good team with a lot of quality pieces coming back. You know, Dave Van Horn mentioned that you know, they know their starting rotation. There's no question about it. They got two guys that were in their rotation last year that are coming back, and then they moved their closer from last year into a starting spot. So there's very few questions. Now, they're not near the talent level of a Connor Nolan, Hagan Smith, Jackson Wiggins, but they have that experience. That's something that really Arkansas doesn't have outside of Connor Nolan. So it, it is going to be a, a formidable opponent, in my opinion. Uh, I've got my predictions out on hogbeat.com and, and I've picked them to sweep this series, but I wrote in there, don't be surprised if one of these games is closer than you may be expected. So as far as, as far as this weekend goes, what give us your thoughts on what you're expecting from Arkansas. Uh, I'm specifically from the starting pitchers. So give us what you're expecting from Connor Nolan Hagen Smith and Jackson Wiggins. You don't have to go in depth, just like maybe a pitch count, maybe a this this guy's gonna do well, or maybe you think this guy's gonna struggle. Just tell us about that. Yeah, I'm I'm really excited to see what Connor Nolan does in that Friday night role, uh, Friday afternoon, I guess. Uh, it sounds like they're gonna have a pitch limit of 60 to 65. I would love to see Connor Nolan get through five innings. Uh, He's sometimes had an issue with that in his starts. Uh, and if he doesn't get through five innings, I bet it's just because of a pitch count. But you, you hope he's a guy that's not going to rack up a ton of strikeouts, although, you know, who knows with Illinois State, uh, maybe that gets his pitch count up. Uh, so I, I'm really excited about him. I'm also excited to see how Hagen Smith just handles the atmosphere, handles the, the stage. Uh, and Jackson Wiggins, for him, I, I would really like to see him get through at least four innings. I know that's going to be a challenge with the pitch count and how his propensity to, to maybe struggle with, with throwing strikes. Uh, but if he could get through four innings, you know, pitch well in that time, that's what I would really like to see. That would give me a lot of confidence, like, hey, maybe this guy needs to stay in the rotation for round rock the next week. All right, well, that's going to wrap it up for us here on the Hogbeat Hour. Reminder, games Friday, Saturday, Sunday, uh, Arkansas versus Illinois State. Let's see, basketball team play Saturday as well. Uh, go check out all of our stuff at hogbeat.com. Give us a thumbs up on the video if you like it. Subscribe to the YouTube, and uh, you will not be disappointed with the content that we produce. But thank you, Hutch. Thank you, Alex Trader. And uh, thank you for listening to the Hogbeat Hour.